Game of Thrones Season 6, Episode 10, the season finale, let's have a look. We begin in King's Landing, with Cersei and Tommen and Marjorie and the Sparrow suiting up for the big trial, with sept bells tolling in the background, an ominous calm before the storm. Everyone comes to the Sept, the Sparrows, the Tyrells, Lancel and Kevin Lannister, the Lords and Ladies of King's Landing, though suspiciously Cersei and Tommen stay at the Red Keep. The trial begins and Loras submits to the Faith, confesses his crimes of banging Renly and lying about it at trial, and as punishment he has to give up the Tyrell name, which pretty much ends House Tyrell, because while in the books Loras has brothers, the show version of Loras is apparently the only heir to their house. The Sparrow's goals aren't just religious, they're political. He's taking down the Great Houses, so now that Tyrell's gone, he turns to Lannister, sending Lancel to go get Cersei. Lancel, for some reason, decides to follow a boy into a basement, where he gets stabbed and discovers the wildfire set to blow up the Sept. Meanwhile, Pycelle is lured to Kyburn's laboratory, where he's killed by little birds. In the books, it's not Kyburn, but Varys who does this. Varys murders Pycelle and Kevin, and gives this cool speech about how he's working to destabilise Westeros to make the Targaryen invasion easier. Though in the books, he's sort of supporting a different Targaryen. It's complicated, but the point is that now Pycelle is dead. Back at the Sept, Marge suspects that something's up, so she tries to evacuate, but it's too late. Lancel tries to stop the wildfire, but he's too slow too, so everything blows the fuck up, killing the Sparrow in his moment of victory, killing the Tyrells in their moment of defeat, killing Cersei's own uncle, Kevin Lannister, and his son Lancel, and all these hundreds or thousands of others, ladies and lords, sparrows, small folk, everyone in and around the Sept is killed by Cersei. How can she justify this terrible crime? In the next scene, we see Cersei with Unella, the shame bell lady, and Cersei says the reason she killed all these people is because it felt good, that imagining their shock and pain is the greatest joy she's ever felt. This is some Ramsay Bolton level evil here. Previously, when Cersei did terrible things, she'd usually tell herself that she did it to protect her kids, but here she's straight up saying that she kills people for pleasure. She's turned to the dark side, and the mountain is the Darth Vader to her emperor. She sends him in to torture Unella, and we get a brief shot of the mountain unmasked. It's hard to see in the dark, but Gregor does pretty much look like Vader. Then we see Tommen, watching his city burn. He has failed as a king by letting his people die. He has failed as a husband by letting his wife Marjorie burn. He has failed as a follower of the faith by letting the sparrow blow up. And of course, none of this is really his fault. He's always been a pawn of other players, manipulated by the sparrow, by Cersei, by Marjorie. He's never really done anything of his own will before, so this death is tragic, not only because he was basically a good kid, and that he never knew his real father, and that his family mistreated him, it's tragic that deciding to die is like the first real choice he's ever made. The joke going around at the moment is that this is why they call it King's Landing, because the king landed. But uh, all this stuff will probably be very different in the books. For starters, the Tommen of the books is like 10 years old. His main activities are to play with his kittens and to try to outlaw beats. Book Tommen won't be jumping out of windows anytime soon. The way it might go down in the books is that Tommen might die some other way, then Cersei will blow up the wildfire in response, in grief and rage. Further, the wildfire in the books probably won't just blow up the Sept. In fact, the wildfire beneath the Sept was found and removed but there is still wildfire all over the city. So maybe it'll be the whole city that burns down. This may happen in the show too somehow, because we still have that vision of the Red Keep burned that hasn't happened yet. Maybe it'll be Danny's dragon fire that sets it off. Anyway, over at the Twins, the Freys and the Lannisters celebrate the retaking of Riverrun. Jamie and Bronn chat, and then Walder comes along and says he and Jamie aren't so different, you and I. They're both Kingslayers. Walder killed King Robb Stark at the Red Wedding, and Jaime killed King Aerys Targaryen during Robert's Rebellion 20 years ago. Both Walder and Jaime are hated for these dishonourable killings, though what Walder doesn't know is that Jaime killed the Mad King for a good reason, to stop Aerys blowing up King's Landing with wildfire. Bit like what Cersei just did. Jaime doesn't want to be like Walder. He increasingly tries to be a good, honourable person, so it'll be interesting to see how he reacts to Cersei's wildfire attack. Cersei sees the dead body of her last child, and it's just like the gypsy woman said. Maggie the Frog prophesied that all Cersei's children would die, gold their crowns and gold their shrouds, and it all came true. So maybe the reason Cersei takes the death of her son so calmly is that she already knew it was going to happen, she'd already grieved, and now she's numb, empty, with nothing left in the world to give her joy except the suffering of her enemies. 
Another part of the prophecy in the books is that Cersei will be replaced by a younger and more beautiful queen. Cersei thought this was Marjorie, but it's probably going to be Danny. In the Reach, Sam and Gilly arrive at the city of Old Town. That lighthouse there is called the High Tower. They're not creative with names here. They go to the Citadel, home of the Maesters, they deal with some annoying bureaucrat, and then Sam's led into the library. Reading is one of Sam's few loves, and this is the biggest library in Westeros, maybe in the world, so this is a dream come true for Samwell Tarly. Of course, it'll also be important to the plot. Maybe Sam will find some book about White Walkers or Azor Ahai or Valyrian Steel, something that could help the humans win the war against the Walkers. Also, that astrolabe thing at the ceiling is the thing from the intro of the show showing the history of Westeros. But yeah, while Sam is reading, it's not clear what Gilly and her baby will do, because the Citadel doesn't accept women and children. In the books, there's heaps of other stuff going on at Old Town, like the Faceless Man Jack and Hagar arrives disguised as an alchemist to steal a book, and one of the Sand Snakes comes disguised as a man to study, and later Ironborn Raiders under Euron arrive. And there's also this enigmatic maester called Marwyn the Mage doing some spooky magic stuff. He might be the Archmaester this guy mentions. So we don't know how much of this will make it into the show, but there's certainly lots of cool content to draw from the books. One likely conflict in the show is that Sam's father Randall may come for his Valyrian steel sword Heartsbane, which we see Sam still has. Up at Winterfell, Jon complains to Mel about having to sit at the back at family feasts. Mel tells him to check his privilege. She grew up as a slave, at least in the books. She is still haunted by nightmares of her childhood, and her original name, by the way, was Melanie. Then Davos arrives and confronts Mel about the murder of Shireen. Mel admits that she did it, admits it was wrong, but argues that Jon should keep her anyway, because she'll be useful in the war against the Walkers. Which is a really good point. Mel is one of the only people who seems to know what the deal is, with the War for the Dawn and Azor Ahai and all that, but regardless, Jon decides to exile Mel, orders her to ride south. Which could go some interesting ways. At the same time Mel heads south, the Brotherhood Without Banners is heading north. Thoros is a red priest like Mel, and in the show they've met before, so maybe they'll catch up, talk about their god and Jon's resurrection and stuff. Brienne and Pod are also heading north, and they get caught up with the Brotherhood in the books, and Arya's also around. When Mel meets her in Season 3, she says they'll meet again. So all of these characters could somehow be involved in whatever comes next for Melisandre. Jon and Sansa talk, and she apologises for not telling Jon about the Knights of the Vale before the Battle of the Bastards. Though she doesn't explain why she didn't tell him, even though it was kind of a big deal strategically, but he accepts her apology. Of course, he should be apologising too. He almost got everyone killed by riding into the middle of the battle instead of sticking to the plan with the trenches. So really, both Sansa and Jon were pretty dumb last episode. The point of this scene, though, is to show some tension and uneasiness between Jon and Sansa. It's not certain if they trust each other, which could lead to conflict next season. Also, a white raven arrives to signify that winter has finally officially come. And it only took six seasons. Elena Tyrell comes to Dawn. She wants revenge on Cersei for killing her family, so she allies with the Sand Snakes, who also hate the Lannisters for the deaths of Oberyn and Elia. Then Varys walks in, representing Daenerys, and they form a powerful three-way alliance between Targaryen, Tyrell, and Martell. Of course, the Sand Snakes aren't really Martells, they're illegitimate bastards who murdered the rightful Lord Doran Martell, and Olena isn't really a Tyrell, she's a red wine who married a Tyrell, so she probably shouldn't be in power either. The politics here don't strictly really make a whole lot of sense, but the overall idea of the alliance is cool, and sets the stage for Daenerys to invade. In Marine, Daenerys breaks up with Dario. She can't bring a lover to Westeros because politically she needs to be open for marriage. Dario is to stay and keep the peace in Marine, which is probably a really bad idea. Dario is a random mercenary. He doesn't know how to govern, and he doesn't care about Marine. And the situation here is still far from okay. Danny has banned slavery and cast down the masters, but there's no new social system to take its place. The sons of the harpy are still out there, and the freed slaves still need protection but Daenerys decides to declare mission accomplished and roll on out anyway. She renames Slaver's Bay to the Bay of Dragons, which is cool, but you could call North Korea Freedom Land and that wouldn't make it true. Conquering a foreign land, destroying the existing social structure, then leaving, can have very bad results. One of the major themes from the books is the messiness and moral complexity of war, and for the show to capture this, it should revisit Marine later to show us the chaos Danny's leaving behind her. On a lighter note, who are the eligible bachelors of Westeros who Danny might marry? Maybe Jaime? Now that he's been released from his Kingsguard vows, he's presumably the heir to House Lannister and all its power. And Jaime might not be so keen on Cersei now that she's a mass murderer and all, so maybe Danny will hook up with Goldenhand. Only catch might be that he killed her dad. 
A better candidate could be John. As the king in the north, he controls a huge chunk of Westeros. He's also supposedly Azor Ahai, the prophesied saviour of the world, just as she is. And he kind of represents ice, in the same way Danny represents fire. And the book series is called A Song of Ice and Fire, so basically, John and Danny could make a hell of a power couple. The only reason why it probably won't happen is that it almost feels too obvious. Danny talks with Tyrion, and he swears himself to her service, seems truly devoted to her cause, which seems kind of sudden, almost out of character. Tyrion's hardly the kneeling type, and in the books he's very cynical about this whole Targaryen restoration business. But it does kind of make sense that he'd be drawn to Danny. Tyrion's just lost his family, and his lover, he's far from home, what he needs now is purpose. And back in Westeros, that was politics. Being Hand of the King made him feel valuable and important, so when Daenerys makes him her hand, that's exactly what Tyrion needs. Same goes for a lot of Danny's followers. She draws all these misfits and exiles and broken men to her, people who need a flag to follow, something to believe in. She offers them hope for a brighter future, so they fight for her. And historically, that's never gone badly, right? Then we see Arya infiltrate the twins disguised with the face of a serving girl. She makes a pie out of Black Walder and Lothar Frey and feeds it to their own father, Walder, who she then kills to avenge the deaths of her mother and brother at the Red Wedding. Fans have pointed out that the three men who arranged the Red Wedding, Walder Frey, Tywin Lannister, and Roose Bolton, are killed in the same way their victims are. Walder has his throat slashed like Catelyn, Tywin is shot with a crossbow like Rob, and Roose is stabbed in the gut just like Talisa, so there's a cool symmetry there. But yeah, Arya has made another kill. She watches and smiles as the man before her dies. And it'll be interesting to see how the show plays Arya's arc in the future. Like, are we meant to cheer as this child dedicates her life to a murder spree? Or should we question whether violent vengeance is the only answer? But for now, there are still targets left on Arya's list. She's killed Poliver, Meryn Trant, and now Walder Frey, but there's still Cersei and Gregor Clegane, so maybe Arya will go after them. But there were others who were on her list temporarily. The Hound for killing Micah, Beric and Thoros and Melisandre for betraying Gendry, and these guys are currently in and around the Riverlands, so maybe something will happen with them. Back at Winterfell, Sansa meets with Littlefinger, in the same spot Ned and Cat meet in Season 1. Littlefinger says that his ultimate goal is to become the King of Westeros, with Sansa at his side, which pretty much fits with what we've seen of him so far. He's always been hungry for power, and he's always wanted Sansa, mostly because she reminds him of her mum, who Littlefinger loved. But Sansa rejects him. She knows that he's only really out for himself, but she also doesn't move against him, which she probably could, and should. Because Littlefinger's a seriously bad dude, right? He killed Sansa's aunt, Lysa. He betrayed Ned Stark. He caused the War of the Five Kings by turning the Lannisters against the Starks. He even helped kill King Joffrey, for what that's worth. Littlefinger is dangerous, and he's worked against the Starks. And as the Lady of Winterfell, Sansa's in a position to take him down. She could tell the Knights of the Vale that Littlefinger killed their Lady Lysa and lied about the Boltons. She could tell the Lords of the North that Littlefinger betrayed their Lord Ned Stark, though we don't know how much Sansa knows about that. Either way, Sansa totally could get Littlefinger imprisoned or executed for his crimes, which would make everybody much safer, but she doesn't. She lets him go. So, while Sansa doesn't team up with Littlefinger here, she leaves that door open, keeps him as a possible ally in the future, which could be really useful, but could also go very badly, because as Sansa says herself, only a fool would trust Littlefinger. Beyond the Wall, Benjen drops off Bran and Mira by her weirwood tree, the same tree John and Sam swear the Night's Watch vows at in Season 1. Benjen says he can't take them through the Wall itself, because the Wall has magic that stops zombies like him from going through, which is the same deal as the book character Cold Hands. The worrying thing is that these spells that protect the wall are probably the magic of the Children of the Forest, the same kind of magic that protected Bloodraven's cave until that magic was broken by the Night King's psychic connection to Bran and that mark he made in Episode 5. Maybe the magic of the wall could be broken in some similar way. So anyway, Benjen leaves, says he'll do what he can to fight the White Walkers, and Bran turns to the Weirwood Tree, says that he's the Three-Eyed Raven now. And again, we don't know exactly what that means, but it involves these visions that he has through Weirwood Trees. And then we get one of the most anticipated moments in the series. Bran has a vision of the birth of Jon Snow. We see a young Ned Stark at the Tower of Joy, seeing his sister Lyanna in a bed of blood, just having given birth to Jon. This finally proves that Jon is not the bastard son of Ned and some unknown woman, but is actually the son of his sister Lyanna. The episode doesn't make clear who the father is, but we know from hints in the books and the show, and from a frankly confusing graph from HBO, that the father of Jon Snow is Rhaegar Targaryen. Rhaegar hasn't appeared in the show, but basically he's the older brother of Daenerys and the son of the Mad King Aerys. 
Some 20 years before the story starts, Rhaegar ran off with Lyanna Stark, and this started Robert's Rebellion, the war that killed Aerys and Rhaegar, and made Robert the King of Westeros. Robert hated Targaryens, he wanted to kill them all, and that's why Jon had to be hidden. As the son of Rhaegar, Jon is half Targaryen, so Ned had to lie and say Jon was his bastard in order to protect him from Robert. That's what Lyanna is talking about here. But yeah, the point of all this is that Jon is the son of a Stark and a Targaryen, of ice and fire. He's the grandson of the Mad King, and the nephew of Daenerys, which makes this potential hookup kind of awkward. But this could have some huge implications. This means that Jon could have a claim on the Iron Throne. He is still a bastard if Lyanna and Rhaegar weren't married, but there are theories that they could have had a secret wedding. Maybe Bran could have a vision of that. Further, as a Targaryen, Jon might be able to ride dragons like Daenerys. He might be fireproof like Daenerys, except there was that one time he got burned. The whole fireproof thing is confusing in the show. But another big thing is that Azor Ahai, the hero prophesied to save the world from darkness, is apparently meant to be from Eris's line. So Jon now fits another part of this prophecy. Also, we see Ned lean Arthur Dane's famous sword, called Dawn, against Lyanna's bed, which kind of connects to another part of the Azor Ahai prophecy, saying that Azor Ahai will be reborn beneath a bleeding star. Dawn is loosely connected with stars, and it's literally covered in blood. So yeah, basically this is more evidence that Jon may be Game of Thrones Jesus. The real question is how Jon and the rest of Westeros will find out about his parentage. Bran could tell Jon, but the rest of Westeros will want proof before they let him sit the Iron Throne or whatever. And there are a few ways this could happen. Maybe Howland Reed, the other survivor of the Tower of Joy, could turn up. Maybe there's some kind of secret hidden still in the Winterfell crypts. We'll have to wait and see, but at least now we know the truth, that Jon is a son of ice and fire. At Winterfell, the Northern Lords declared Jon the King in the North, the White Wolf, just as Robb Stark was the Young Wolf. And this is super cool, though it doesn't make much political sense. Like sure, Jon was brave at the Battle of the Bastards, but he's also a deserter of the Night's Watch, which is punishable by death. And he let wildlings through the Wall, which most of the North hates. And he's a bastard, not the Lord of Winterfell, Sansa is the rightful ruler. And half these lords weren't even at the battle, they've never met Jon before, so why do they all love him and trust him so much? If Jon becomes king in the north in the books, it'll happen a very different way. There's this whole thing with Rob naming Jon his heir as king, then sending Mage Mormont and Galbert Glover to Howland Reed, so maybe in the books those guys will turn up and reveal Rob's wishes. It's probably fair that the show simplifies this though. The point is that Jon now rules a huge chunk of Westeros, apparently including the Vale, because Littlefinger says he has sworn to House Stark, but of course, we know not to trust Littlefinger. He wants Sansa, not Jon, in charge in the North, so we'll likely see some conflict between these guys next season. Littlefinger may try to turn Sansa against Jon. Then Jaime returns to King's Landing, like Troy and Community, and this is definitely the darkest timeline. Cersei sits the Iron Throne, crowns herself the ruler of Westeros, while her city still burns in the background. She's gone full evil queen here, this is some Dark Lord shit. She's not the rightful ruler, she's a dictator who seized power by blowing up everyone else. Maybe you could call that right of conquest, but this is not a stable regime. The people will hate her because she just blew up the equivalent of the Vatican. She has no allies or army as far as we know, and the Tyrells, Martells and Targaryens are allied against her. So this reign of terror probably won't last long. The interesting drama will be Jaime's response. He'll be having flashbacks to Aerys, the mad king he killed to protect the people. If Jamie is to become this better person he's trying to be, maybe he'll have to kill his lifelong lover, this terrible new mad queen. Which would, by the way, fulfill another part of this prophecy, that Cersei would be killed by her Valenquire, or little brother. The episode ends with another much anticipated moment. Daenerys Targaryen finally sails for Westeros, with a huge fleet full of Unsullied and Dothraki and Ironborn, not to mention three dragons. She's also got Varys and Tyrells and Martell ships, so this must be months after the rest of the episode, because of the travel time. But side note, this is the first time we've seen Varys and Daenerys together, and they actually have a lot to talk about, because Varys has been fucking with Daenerys' life for years. His scheming with Illyrio led to Danny's marriage with Khal Drogo. Varys informed on Danny to the small council, and ordered an assassination attempt on her once. And Danny does know this, even in the show, so she should have some tough questions for the eunuch. Another little thing is that it's kind of weird to see the Dothraki so comfortable at sea, when it's kind of a thing that they're terrible sailors, maybe that'll come up later. But this is a great way to end the season. Daenerys is finally set to take the throne. So let's look at the situation at the end of the season. 
On the Iron Throne, you've got Cersei Lannister, with Kyburn and the Mountain at her side. Jaime's there too, and he might do something to stop her. Allied against Cersei are the Tyrells under Elena and Dawn under the Sand Snakes, who are supporting Daenerys Targaryen, sailing in from the east with Tyrion and Varys and Missandei and Grey Worm and Yara and Theon and an army. The King of the Iron Islands is Euron Greyjoy, and he'll probably be a big bad guy next season. Remember, he wants to kill Yara and Theon, marry Danny, and take over the world, and in the books he has these schemes involving black magic and dragons. Jon Snow is the king in the north, supported by the Northern Houses and by Tormund's wildlings, while Sansa is apparently still the Lady of Winterfell. The North is supposedly supported by the Vale, ruled in name by Robert Arryn, but in practice by Littlefinger, who'll probably also be a big baddie next season. It's not clear who rules the Riverlands, now that Walder Frey's dead, but Edmure Tully is still alive, so maybe his power could eventually be restored. For now you've got Beric, Thoros, the Hound, Brienne, Pod, and Arya all in the Riverlands, with Melisandre coming in from the North, so all sorts of stuff could happen around there. Down south, Sam and Gilly are in Old Town, and Randall and Dickon might come for them. Over in Essos, Marine is left to Dario and the Sons of the Harpy, and presumably Kinvara and the Red Priests are still there. Kinda weird they didn't do much this season. Jorah is wandering around Essos somewhere, looking for a cure for his grayscale. Gendry is still rowing around somewhere as well, presumably. We might also see Tycho Nestoris again. Remember the crown owes a bunch of money to the Iron Bank? But of course, the biggest threat of all is posed by the White Walkers up in the north with their army of the dead. Dolorous Ed and the Wall probably can't stop them on their own, nor can Benjen, so Bran and Mira better get south soon. The big conflicts next season will probably be Danny's invasion against Cersei and maybe Euron, there'll be stuff in the north between Jon and Sansa and Littlefinger, but above all there'll be the War for the Dawn between the White Walkers and everyone else. There are just two short seasons of Game of Thrones left, like 13 hours of content. This is the beginning of the end. So Game of Thrones Season 6 is done, but there is still so much Thrones left to talk about, with theories and analysis of characters and plot, and predictions and speculation about the future of the series, and heaps of stuff in the books that doesn't even appear in the show. So this is the kind of content you'll be seeing from Alt Shift X when we return in August. We're taking a break for a while. The Patreon will be paused, so no one will be charged for July. But make sure to subscribe so you don't miss future videos. If you'd like to be notified the moment videos come out, you can press the bell button on the Alt Shift X channel on the YouTube app on your phone. Also, if you haven't read the books, now is a really good time to start. The books are everything you love about the Game of Thrones show, but more. More detail, more depth, more complexity, more drama, more politics, more mysteries, more magic, so many extra little connections and relationships and backstories and side characters and histories. The books are amazing. They're not the easiest read, they are dense and complex and very bloody long, but if you can get into them, you'll really enjoy them. So there's a link in the description to buy the books. It's an Amazon link that supports the channel if you use it at no extra cost to you. Otherwise you can find the books by other ways online. If you've already read the books and you want to go deeper down the rabbit hole, go check out the Game of Thrones forums, like the Song of Ice and Fire subreddit and Westeros.org. Many of the ideas and theories discussed on this channel come from those forums. Also the podcasts. There are heaps of great Game of Thrones podcasts. Two of the biggest and best are Radio Westeros and History of Westeros. Really in-depth analysis of story, themes, theories, predictions, so go and check them out. Between the podcasts and the forums and the books and this channel, there is plenty of Thrones content to last until next season. And if we're lucky, we might even get a new book soon. So thank you for watching. Thank you for commenting and liking and subscribing. And thank you for the emails and tweets and messages. I'm sorry I can't reply to them all, but the support is really sweet. Thanks for the caption translators who have been making captions available in dozens of languages. And the biggest of thanks goes to the patrons on Patreon. This Season 6 Explained series, doing a video every week, would have been totally impossible without your support. This channel has come a long way from where it was a year ago, thanks to you patrons. In fact, one of the things we're doing now is we're looking for a production assistant to help make videos faster. So if you're good with After Effects, and you know Game of Thrones well, and you're free for some production work, especially during Season 7, please click on the link to the Google form below to apply. Shout out to patrons Jason A. Digmuller, Reverend Zandria, Mr. Fifa SA, Cameron Weiss, David Howe, Vanya Dog, Eric Lewis Dreyfus, Jason Pan, Eric Kirkendall, Sin Bobby Joe, Kate Lyons, Ryan Steele, Michael Appel, Brandon L. Staggs, Jason Rattray, Fallon M., Craig Riley, Sean Ludka, Todd Marcus, Chris Cole, Jake Berling, Chris Amolsh, Matthew Elisha Williams, Fred Petty, Moy Rain Sade, Kevin Donahue, Sandeep Rath, X Domas, Turd Ferguson, Jory Strack, Neil Ram Roop, and Ricky Mint. Thank you all for your support. See you in August.